Great words, great music. The Lord is in control. And never doubt that. Never forget that. Always build your life on Him. Appreciate the ministry of uh, music by Jen and Kendall and Anthony. Um, appreciate uh, Kendall. He's doing a wonderful job working with our youth and also teaching uh, the older children as well. So we are blessed here. A lot of good going on. Uh, we can look at the glass half empty or half full. I look at it, God's in control. And he's not abdicated the throne, not turned it over to anyone else. It's his battle. We're on the winning side. And I'm here to encourage you. This morning a lot of people are down and discouraged and hurting. And I say, God is good all the time. And... Um, we need to believe that. We need to live accordingly. Got a new grandbaby, so I'm thankful for that. His name is Finn Tucker. I thought they should have named his middle name Tastic. You know, it could have been Fantastic, but they didn't like that, so they didn't, they didn't ask my thoughts on that. But he's healthy, 8 pounds, 10 ounces, 21 inches long, and they're home and doing good, and i um, thankful for that. Also, today is our family ministries director's birthday, Dave Roman. His, uh, I won't say how old he is. He's younger than me. That's all that matters. So, see, Dave, wish him a happy birthday. I told him he can no longer. I told him that a while ago, about four or five years ago. We had a church softball pickup game, and Dave hurt himself when he swung and missed and pulled an oblique muscle. So I told him he's out. I think the youth are playing a, a football game um, coming up uh, uh, flag football, but I told Dave, don't even think about playing. You're not going to be on the IR or workman's comp or anything if you hurt yourself. So um, we're looking forward to uh, that with the youth. The youth are also having a, a wing fest right around Thanksgiving. And um, as far as uh, things shutting down, always just watch the Facebook, watch the website. If you have further questions, if they say I mean, some schools are shut down now. Um, people have all kind of thoughts about whether the state's going to shut down. Um, just follow our Facebook. Um, we need to be together in the body of Christ. We need to encourage each other. So you just watch, but pray for the staff and the leadership of the church. Um, I've said before, Satan's goal is to isolate and to keep us apart from encouraging each other. We need to know we're not alone. We need to be able to see people. I, I told you last week, you can turn to First Peter chapter 1. This is all extra for free. But um, I told you last week that um, I sometimes pretend I know somebody with a mask on. <laughs> Happened again to me Monday. I was a giant eagle, and someone goes, Hi, Pastor Dave. I'm like, it was in Richmond. I'm like, okay, I pretend, hi, how you doing? I'm here to get mom a birthday cake. I'm like, well, I must know your mom. Because she said that, and I'm like, how old is your mom? And then she told me, I'm like, I think I know her. And then I took a stab at it and said her brother's name. I said, yeah. And then she, that's who it was, so I was blessed. But then <laughs> later this week, <laughs> I said I was at the store, and I was in the tea section, and the guy was talking to me. I didn't know who it was. I couldn't tell, and he had a uniform on. And um, it happened to be uh, Mike Noel when I went home. Um, Jeremy said, yeah, that was Mike Noel. He works for the post office. So I get a phone call. I'm in Ace's Hardware um, doing Jeremy's work because he's having a baby. Come on now. He, he's getting out of work at home because he's having a baby. What kind of excuse is that? But I, I'm in there, and I see Mike Noel. I'm like, I wonder what's up. So I pick it up. Hey, what's He goes, should I get diet or regular iced tea? He was watching at home, and he, I said, I got busted because I didn't know who you were, right, Mike? So... 
God is good. He's in control. And let's read uh, 1 Peter chapter 1 as we work our way through. If you want to read ahead, you don't get extra points, but you can read ahead all through 1 Peter. It's only five chapters. But we're in verses 3 to 5 this week. Praise be to the God of our, and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you're sovereign. Lord, we thank you that you're good, that you love us. You demonstrated that love by giving your Son to die in our place on the cross of Calvary. We're thankful that we can approach you through Jesus Christ, our great high priest. You're an approachable God. You want a relationship with each one of us. Lord, help us not to get bogged down, not to get discouraged, not to throw in the towel, not to quit, not to be pessimistic. Help us to live as people with hope and to realize that we have a great inheritance. Help us to walk by faith and not by sight. Lord, would you speak to us through your word and through your spirit? May we be encouragers of each other in our walk with you. We pray this in the strong and the mighty name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Lots of books, lots of seminars that focus on developing and maintaining a positive attitude. And we hear people saying, you need a PMA. You need a positive mental attitude. And people wear all kinds of shirts today, I said. And I, I personally don't go to, I'm not a beach person to begin with. The sand and salt water and all that doesn't sound fun to me. And I've been to the beach numerous times. And if you like it, I apologize and keep going. Don't stop going. My idea of a beach is Ligonier Beach. But um, some of you know what that is and some of you have no clue what that is. But that's my idea of a beach. Um, but I also know that when I'm at the boardwalk and I haven't been there for a while, people wear all kinds of shirts. And sometimes they're pretty vulgar shirts. And I'm like, they have little children with them. And I'm like... Your children don't need a spanking. You need a spanking. So I see that. But there's also shirts out there that say, yes, I have an attitude. And we talk about people needing an attitude adjustment. And think about this, this interesting fact. There doesn't seem to be any push to promote seminars or books on developing a negative or bad attitude. You don't have to teach people that. We have this uncanny knack, this innate tendency to have a poor attitude that's fostered by a couple things, sometimes by life circumstances. Sometimes we say my attitude comes from the environment in which I grew up, or it's the situations that I'm finding myself having to deal with. So yeah, I have a poor attitude. My point being, it's necessary for us as followers of Jesus Christ to develop and maintain good attitudes because they don't happen naturally or automatically. And last week at one of the services, I said four things we need today to minister to the world. First of all, love God with all our being. Second, love people with the agape love of 1 Corinthians 13. Third, whatever we do, do with excellence to the glory of God. And fourth, have a good attitude. So it doesn't come naturally. It's important to know that we must have a God-given desire to have a good attitude because, quite frankly, some people, too many people, have such poor attitudes that, if they're honest, they have no inclination whatsoever to want to change. They seem perfectly content with the way they are, even if and when they're pessimistic, bitter, cranky, mean-spirited. And I'll stop with the descriptions there. But they're content with that. In John 5, Jesus encounters a man who was lying by the pool of Bethesda. This man had been unable to walk for 38 years. It was believed by many that an angel came and he stirred the pool waters. And the first one to get into the waters after the pool, there was a ripple in the pool, that individual would be healed. So Jesus approaches this man who had been lame for 38 long years. And he asked what seems to be a bizarre question. John 5, 6, he asked the man, do you want to get well? One would assume that it was because the man wanted to get well that he hung out 
by the pool of Bethesda, that he frequent, frequently visited there. It's quite possible that Jesus asked this particular individual the question he did because Jesus may have known that this man had an attitude, no problem, because Jesus knows every thought. In Mark chapter 2, Jesus, when the man was let down through the hole in the roof by his four friends, the man was paralyzed. He was laying on a litter or a stretcher, and Jesus said, your sins are forgiven you. And it says that opponents of Jesus began to think within themselves, within their own minds, hey, this guy's guilty of blasphemy. Who can forgive sins? But God, it says Jesus knew their thoughts. Maybe in John chapter 5 with this lame man, Jesus knew he had reached the point of hopelessness. And he understood there was nothing that Jesus could do for this man if he didn't long to be able to walk. Jesus may have been aware that this man had long abandoned hope of being healed. And in fact, he had just cashed in his chips. He'd given up. There was no point in it anymore. He surrendered to the circumstance and to his plight. There are times in our lives when we want to throw up our hands and surrender. I quit. I give up. In resignation, I'm done. I'm done with it. I just quit. I'm going to walk away from this. We give up because the situation is extremely difficult. We don't see any possible solution to our dilemma, so we say to ourselves, well, I might as well just accept my lot in life. I might as well accept my predicament. There's no possible way of change or victory. There doesn't seem to be any problem, any solution to my my problem. So we stop trying to rectify anything. And we then allow ourselves to be overwhelmed by the circumstances. I say all the time, people go, I'm okay under the circumstances. And my answer is, what are we doing under the circumstances? We have a great God. We're controlled by our situations. And then we find ourselves being prone to wallowing in self-pity and essentially just accepting defeat. We communicate either by our words or by our deeds or our body posture that we're disillusioned. We're disgusted. We're depressed, and overall, we're in a bad place in life. And I've talked to numerous people this week. How are you doing? Okay. Well, you really sound like you're doing okay. Or you really look like you're doing okay. You're not. And there's part of us sometimes when people are like that, we're like, I'm not even going to ask them what's going on because they'll tell me, and I really don't want to hear it. And so we pretend, but we are in tough times in America. And if we're like that, no one wants to be around us because we're bitter and we're obviously unhappy. And if that describes you at all, let me challenge you to make a commitment today to be different, to refuse to wallow in despair and to be a person of gloom and doom, a person that's miserable to be around, a person that people want to avoid. Refuse to be that person that people say, don't go near them. They'll bring you down. They'll suck you down. They're negative. They'll discourage you. You can be having a great day, and they'll bring you down. They'll change your day. Following in our bulletin, we see developing a positive attitude. Christians, those who profess Jesus Christ, who say, I am a follower of Jesus Christ, first of all, develop positive attitudes by having a solid grasp of God's Word. That means we need to commit ourselves to studying the Bible with the prayerful goal of understanding. That requires meditation on the Scriptures, mauling it over in our mind, not just taking a superficial read-through and say, well, I read the Bible today, and then someone says, what'd you read? I don't even remember what I read, and I don't know what it meant. I just read it because I'm reading through the Bible in a year. We want to understand its meaning. We have the Holy Spirit living in us who helps us understand Scripture. And not only do we want to understand it, we want to make practical application of what we understand in our daily lives. Look at verse 3. It seems as soon as Paul or Peter starts penning this letter, this first letter we know as 1 Peter, Peter is thinking of a living hope. Here's the bad news, first of all. We are all sinners by nature. No exception. Paul said in Romans, there's none righteous. No, not even one. He went on in that same chapter 3 of Romans, verse 23, to say, We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. 
Because of our sin, we are cut off, separated from God. We are rendered spiritually dead. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. Ezekiel 18.4, the soul that sins, it shall die. And Paul, writing to the church in Ephesus, in Ephesians 2.12, said this, If we are without Christ, we are without God. And consequently then, we're without hope. The one thing that a spiritually dead person desperately needs is new life. That's where the gospel, which literally means the good news of Jesus Christ comes into play. By sending his son into this world for the express purpose of dying on the cross for our sins, Jesus did for us what we are incapable of doing for ourselves. He satisfied our sin debt when he shed his blood on the cross, when he took your sins and my sins on his body on the cross. He made it possible for us to have forgiveness of sin. For us to be reconciled to a holy God. Look again at verse 3. Through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, death, burial, and resurrection, God has made it entirely possible for us to have that new birth we so desperately need. That's, this new birth is exactly what Jesus was talking to when He had a meeting with a nighttime meeting with the Pharisee named Nicodemus in John chapter 3. Nicodemus came to Jesus and he said, we know that you're from God because nobody could do the works that you're doing unless God is with them. And right after that, Jesus told Nicodemus, who was a religious leader, schooled in the scripture, the Old Testament scriptures, he said, unless a man is born again, born from above, he cannot see, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. He didn't say it just once. He said it twice. You must be born again. Sadly, some people boldly, brazenly, and wrongfully declare, I don't need to be born again in order to get to heaven. But again, Jesus said, if a man is not born again, born from above, born by the Spirit, doesn't have a new birth, he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. It's unfortunate that some people get bogged down, hung up in the details of the exact date of their salvation. I don't know my exact date. I just know I was in junior church when I was a young boy, and I prayed and asked Jesus Christ into my life. But we need to know this. The reality of being born again, of being saved, of being uh, converted, of being uh, regenerated, whatever word you want to use, it, the reality that is demonstrated, not by the details surrounding the experience, but listen, by the clear evidence of a changed life. The important truth is this. If we are truly born again, there should be indisputable evidence of a changed, transformed life. The pre-Christ you and the post-Christ you, after you met Christ, and especially if you were an adult, what are your values? What are the priorities in your life? They should, they have to be different if you are a child of God. And Paul gave the church at Corinth some good instructions. Test yourself. Look at your life. Examine yourself to see if you are in the faith. What evidence is there in my life that Jesus Christ has saved me? Because Paul told the church at Corinth also, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things become new. That means if you are a Christian, you can never be the same. You can't go back to the way you were. And salvation is by grace. It is a gift. We did nothing to deserve it. We can't pay off our own sin debt through self-effort. Paul told Titus, out of God's great mercy, he saved us. He's given us newness of life. Now, there's no denying today that people are out there demonstrating a need for something to hope for. During this pandemic, this COVID-19, people are struggling. They're looking for hope. A lot of people admit to being scared or anxious. And we just went through an election. And every four years, our nation elects a new president. And people put their hopes on that new president only to be disappointed 
numerous times. But hopefully we're determined to vote again. And I'm a Pitt fan and sports people who follow their team when a new season begins have all kind of hopes. And if you're a Pitt fan, it only takes one or two games to lose that hope. You go, well, what was I thinking? This year is going to be different. Students begin a new school year with real hope. And oftentimes their hopes are dashed. But it, is, it has to be different for the Christian. We have a hope that cannot be squashed no matter what the election, no matter what the pandemic, no matter what's going on. Our hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ. My hope is in you, Lord, all the day long. I will not be shaken. We have no business, but the devil, his, one of his favorite tools is discouragement. And he's having a field day in our lives. And I talk to myself as well. I'm not up here above all of you. I'm in the trenches with you. Our hope is much more than wishful thinking. It is a strong, unshakable confidence that our great and go loving God will give us not all we want, but certainly all we need. Philippians 4.19, My God shall supply all your needs according to His riches and glory in Christ Jesus. That was Paul's message to the church in Rome in Romans 8.32 where he said, think about this, He who did not spare His own Son, but He gave Him up for us all. God, He didn't spare His own Son. He gave His Son for us. How will he not also, along with him, what he's already given us, graciously give us all things? He's going to give us everything we need. Paul's question is a rhetorical one. He's not going to withhold anything from us that we need. If God gave us his son Jesus Christ to die for us and then to live within us, how could we possibly imagine that he's not going to give us everything we need for time and eternity? It's crucial to understand that our hope isn't in man. It is in deity. It is in Almighty God that our hope is. Let's take another look at verse 3. Why do we pin our hopes on God doing something certain or sure for us? Peter tells us because of Christ's resurrection. Think about this. On Good Friday, it seemed like God had a problem. His son, the very one he ordained, ordained as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, on Good Friday was dead. But God addressed that problem in a superlative fashion. God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. That's what Easter or Resurrection Sunday is all about. We can say, God, you are the God of my problems as well as my successes. You are the God of my beginning, my end, and everything in between. Knowing what you do with problems God, how you handle problems. God, I am 100% confident that you can handle what's going on today. The believer's hope is born of confidence and based on the historical fact that God raised his son Jesus Christ from the dead. Peter's positive approach to life is also connected to his understanding of the gift of the believer's new status. In addition to being born into a living hope, that's spending eternity with God. Verse reading on says, We also, as Christians, have received a new inheritance. It's quite likely at this point, as Peter's writing, that the words of Jesus from the Sermon on the Mount are echoing in his head in Matthew chapter 6, 19 to 21. Jesus said, Listen, my followers, lay up your treasures where? In heaven. Not where? On earth. Lay up your treasures up there, not here. Because where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. And Peter is thinking of the change in his own heart. He's thinking about who he was before Christ came into his life, before he met Christ. He used to be engrossed, caught up, absorbed in his fishing business. Think about what Peter had going for him then. Life was about an old boat, stinking fish, and salt to pack them in order he could make money to live a better lifestyle. But God changed his destiny and his values and his priorities. 
Peter now has a real appreciation of what it really means to be a child of God. And I think too many of us don't understand what it means to be a child of God. Christians, we have this incredible inheritance that can never be taken away from us. God guarantees we can and we will not lose this glorious inheritance. Peter is just reiterating what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount about moth and rust and thieves that can come and destroy these temporal pleasures and treasures that we're pursuing. Many people constantly fret about what they will or won't inherit. And I can tell you, there was a time I thought I might get some money, and then my parents went into the nursing home. And guess what? It's a good thing I wasn't counting on it, and it doesn't matter. And then we see people saying, I'm, parents saying, I'm spending my, grand, my kid's inheritance. You know, I'm having a good time with life. My friend, if you put your faith in Christ alone for salvation, you can and you should be displaying a positive attitude because you have an incredible hope and a tremendous inheritance to look forward to. In addition to our hope and inheritance, we as children of God have also been given another great gift, the gift of security. Peter describes this in verse 5. There are three tenses of salvation. The past tense, I have been saved. We have, if we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we have been delivered from sin's penalty. What's sin's penalty? The wages of sin is death. Now we're alive. Ephesians 2.1, you hath he quickened or made alive who were dead in your sins and trespasses. You're alive now. John 5, 24, if you believe in me, Jesus says you pass from death into life. I'm forgiven. Second, the present thing. I am being saved progressively, experientially. I am being transformed. I am being changed. There are things in my life that, praise God, they're different after I came to trust in Jesus. In the future tense, I will be saved for all eternity. We will be finally and completely delivered from the very presence of sin. In the last time, and I think we're getting closer and closer to the last time if you read the description of what the last days will be like. And Paul's writing to Timothy. And Peter's saying there'll be skeptics going, where is he? I thought he's coming back. In the last time, the Lord himself will come and he will take his people to be with him. And then we will forever praise him for saving us from the penalty, the power, and the presence of sin. Do you have that hope? Do you have that confidence? Sometimes when I see people that I love, and I'm their pastor, their shepherd, I love and I see them and I'm like, wow, they might not be here very much longer. And my heart aches for their family, but I go, I'm actually jealous of them. I wouldn't want to go through what they're going through. I wouldn't want to maybe die that way. But you know what? When they breathe their last breath, it's all over. And they go to be with Jesus. And man, I can't wait to be with Jesus. It's going to be so wonderful. And, and I can guarantee you, 100 years from now, you're not going to give a flying leap about who was the president. And you're not going to care about the pandemic and all these other things because we're going to be with Jesus. And it's going to be so wonderful. And we're going to be celebrating. We're not going to be dwelling on the negative things. Put it this way. What God starts, he finishes. That was Paul's proclamation in Philippians 1.6. He who began a good work in you. When did he begin a good work in you? When you put your faith in him, he saved you. He put you into his family. He will complete that good work. He will carry it on to completion to the day of Christ Jesus. Look again at verse 5. We are guarded or shielded. By God's power. Our hope is directly linked to Christ's resurrection. Our security is directly connected to the power of Almighty God. The battle is the Lord's. We win. We need only to look to Christ's resurrection for assurance that God's power is much more adequate for all situations. Let me say something of utmost importance to you, though. Here's the problem. Get this. God's power is only operative in our lives through faith. Simply put, you have to trust Him. You have to believe 
to enjoy it. And I said, and I've said it before, there's a popular bumper sticker out that says, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Listen, we can omit the third part, the middle part of that. Here's the fact. God said it, that settles it. Whether you or I believe it, God's not going, you don't believe it? Well, then it's not true. He said it, that settles it. He said there's a great attorney awaiting us. That's why it is imperative to provide faithful teaching in the Word of God. We have to immerse ourselves in the Scriptures. And as long as I am pastor, or as long as Pastor Steve's speaking here, I guarantee you it's going to be the Word of God that's our authority, that's our textbook. It's always going to be that way. I was talking to someone this week, and they said, it took courage to speak what you did last week. I'm always going to speak the truth. Believe me, it takes courage. And I pray all the time, and I appreciate I love being the shepherd of this church, this body. I love it. I love the fact that people love Jesus, and they're growing in their faith, and He's changing lives. It's not just doing an academic exercise of looking at the Bible. We should be approaching our study saying, what does this mean? How does it apply to my everyday life? What does God want me to know? And then when I know, what does He want me to do? So many of us deceive ourselves by saying, well, I'm good. I read a few Bible verses today, so I'm good to go. My question to you is, what did you do with what you read? What did you do with that? Did it make any difference whatsoever in how you went about your day? Jesus wants us to follow him. James said in James chapter 1, don't be just a hearer of the word. Be a doer. Don't deceive yourselves. You see, we can sit in church and we can hear the Bible. We can sit at home and read the Bible. But if we think that's it, no, we need, we must make application. And the fact is, if we don't study and apply the Scriptures, we're going to find ourselves dragged away by the things of this world, which have a strong attraction to our old man. And in no time, many could testify that we'll find ourselves down and we're struggling spiritually. When we're in a good place spiritually, we'll, know, we'll have no trouble understanding this, that the church of Jesus Christ must be a community where there's a solid diet of teaching the Bible. The church must be a community where interpersonal relationships are developed so we're able to encourage each other. That's why I say COVID is something the devil's using, to isolate us. Listen, we need each other. We're not alone. We're not alone. There are a bunch of people who love Jesus. And if we just stay in our house and never go out and never interact, we're not going to know that. And we're going to find ourselves going down like, wow, I'm really depressed. I'm really discouraged. Wait a minute. There's other people out there who love Jesus, and I can't wait to see them, and I can't wait to talk with them. We need to be a community where such people are able to gently and lovingly remind us when we're off track. This week I said, I'm disheartened with what's going on. And I was talking to him. I said, you need to pray for your pastor. And he said, I will pray for you. And he said, you know what? The sky's blue. It's a beautiful day out there. I'm not going to let the devil rob me of joy, joy, joy. We have a great life. We have a great future. That's what I needed to hear. So ask yourself, is there someone, anyone in your life who is empowered to correct you, to turn you around and help build in you the positive attitudes that should be prominent in the child of God's life? If you haven't figured it out yet, I think most of you have, our society is riddled with bad attitudes, bad attitudes on every hand. Suspicion, distrust, deceit, abuse, selfishness, egocentricity, and used to be latent, but now it's blatant violence, just ready to come about at the drop of a hat. Here's my prayer for all of us in the body of Christ. We understand our blessings. And we encourage each other to demonstrate how what God has done for us gives us strength and hope. We can't be running around going, the sky is falling. We have hope. The world's running around saying that. Let's not join them. 
Let's go through life. I'm not denying these are tough times. They're tough times. They can suck me down if I let it. But I got to keep, Hebrews 12 says, fix your eyes on Jesus. I got to look at him. I got to look past this temporary life and go, there's a great eternity that awaits me. Press on. Let's go. Let's not quit. Let's keep going. As he writes this epistle, Peter was most likely fully aware that he himself was in great danger of having his life snuffed out. But you never guess it from his cheerful words in verse 3. Blessed praise be the God of our Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. A positive attitude is often demonstrated by praise. Peter's goal in recounting the truths we've already considered is to persuade others to join him in praising God. He insists that we should praise God because God in His great mercy has given us a new birth, He's given us a living hope, and He's given us an eternal inheritance. We should further praise God because He's given us His own power to guard us, and God will complete the salvation He began in us. And when our enemies have done their worst, which could possibly mean death, that simply means an early introduction to our eternal inheritance. Unfortunately, there is this tendency for believers to become obsessed with our difficult circumstances when they come our way. And notice I said, when, not if. The reality is, as long as we have breath and we're on this earth and we have a sound mind, there's going to be difficult times in our lives. That's inescapable. It's inevitable. It's undeniable. The problem is, we spend far too much time and effort seeking a quick solution instead of focusing on what are, what are my most profound beliefs. It's in these stressful times that we need to choose to commit to centering our hearts and minds on who God is. God, you are great. You're greatly to be praised. God, I think of everything you've already done for me in my life. I can go back over my life and chronicle the things God's already done. I was stressed about this, this. He brought me through all those things. If someone would have said in advance, this will happen, this will happen, this will happen, I said, can I opt out of that? But he's brought me through those things. He's just given me a brand new, a brand new ba- a grandson. Life is good even though trials are difficult. God is faithful. So we need to know what he's who He is, what He's done for us, what He's doing now, and what He is going to do. And our praise must be intelligently and intentionally rooted in truth rather than based on how we're feeling at any given moment. Because guess what? Our feelings are all over the place. If you were watching TV Tuesday, wow! Ugh. You know, and then I quit watching. I quit watching now. I've taken a fast from that, from the news just going, you know what? God, you're in control. I'm just going to watch you read your word and minister to people and love people, and I'm not getting sucked into that. It's so easy to get down a path. But I'm going, God, I'm focusing on you. I'm helping people. I'm loving people. He brought people into my life this week. I'm walking the dog, and I run into two people. I'm going, how cool is that? Guy said, I haven't been here for ages. said, I'll see you Sunday. I go, God made me walk the dogs at that time. He was here this morning. Ran into another neighbor. Ran into someone at the football game. Ran into someone driving down my street. And it's like, wow, Lord, it's a reminder you're in control. You love me. You put these people in my life. Some of them need minister to. One guy's got terrible cancer. He goes, I haven't taken my medicine because I've been sick. He goes, I want to be in church Sunday. He was here this morning. I'm going, God, that's what life's all about. Focusing on you. Focusing on what you're doing. Trusting you, ministering to other people. God never changes. Circumstances, sky's blue, it's a great day, tomorrow's going to rain, it's lousy out. No, God never changed. He said, I am the Lord, I do not change. Sometimes, if we're going to be honest, we're guilty. Someone comes and they're hurt and they're down and out. And we pat them on the back and <laughs> we mean it well. And we say something like, well, praise the Lord. People that are going through deep waters don't just need a slap on the back, a pat on the back. What they need is someone to enter the deep waters alongside them and to quietly and gently and humbly remind them of the deep truths of their faith. 
preferably when they're ready to be encouraged. Timing is critical. Peter, despite his own difficult circumstances, used the word hope. So let me say, in addition to being people giving to praise God, we should be filled with expectant hope. We should exhibit vibrant faith because we understand that we are protected by God's might. Praise and hope and faith are the stuff, the ingredients that make a positive attitude. Our world today desperately needs to see a body of believers, a church that is producing individuals with a positive attitude because quite honestly, anybody can be negative. Anybody can be destructive. Anybody can be divisive. There's so much negativity and division in the United States today. We can't deny that. It takes very different people to live positively in this negative hostile environment. And I'll close with a thought-provoking quote. It's not in the Scriptures, so don't try to find it. Think about this. It's a well-established fact that any donkey can kick down a barn, but it takes a craftsman to build one. My question is, are you going to be a donkey tearing down or a craftsman building up? Let us pray. As our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, let me ask you the most important question. Do you know Jesus Christ personally as your Savior? Has there been some time in your life where you said, yes, I want to put my faith in you, Jesus? If you know that, thank God for that salvation that he's given you, that new birth. But maybe there's one here or someone watching that says, I can't honestly say that. I don't have that confidence, that peace that I know Jesus. I want to. You can pray a prayer similar to this. Jesus said, the one that comes to me, I'll never turn away. In the quietness of your own heart. Dear Lord Jesus, today, Lord, I admit, I agree, I am a sinner. And I am thankful that you went to the cross and gave your life and shed your blood to pay for my sin. Lord Jesus, would you please forgive me? Would you cleanse me? And Jesus, I'm opening my life and I'm inviting you in to be my Savior. And I'm mindful that you want to be the ruler of my life from now on. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. So our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. If you prayed that prayer today, I just ask you to slip your I'm not going to point you out in any fashion. Yes, are there any others who say, I prayed, I asked Jesus into my life. Perhaps there are those who say, Pastor, I want to be that person that demonstrates praise and hope and faith. When I think of everything that God's done for me, He's given me a hope and a security and inheritance. I want to be a positive light for Jesus Christ in this world that's so dark. Pray for me, Pastor. Are there any like that? Lots of hands. Father, Thank you that you're in control. Lord, there's another in the fire and we'll never be alone. Thank you, Lord, no matter what we feel. Your word tells us you'll never abandon us. You'll never leave us, never forsake us. Lord, let us walk by faith. Let us be encouragers of one another in this battle of life. Thank you you've given us, you guarding us with your power. And Lord... Let us build up each other. Let us be used to bring others to our Savior. It's in his name we pray. Amen.